Hello and welcome to A Call to Arms, a series of interviews discussing a range of issues relevant to defence with UK practitioners at the top of their profession. I'm Andy Young and I work for the Military Sciences Research Group here at the Royal United Services Institute on Whitehall. Each month, I will host an interview with a senior leader from within the UK Armed Forces, exploring the issues that face defence today and tomorrow, giving you the inside story on how the military orientates itself to face future challenges. This series is kindly supported by Airbus, a company that employs 12 and a half thousand people around the UK and contributes £7 billion to UK GDP. Morning. This month on A Call to Arms, we speak to Major General Paul Griffiths, Director of Personnel, British Army. Commissioned into the Royal Signals in 1993, Major General Griffiths has commanded Signals Unit at every level from troop to brigade, latterly providing cyber and communications readiness to Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, Joint Helicopter Command and Standing Joint Forces Headquarters. Major General, good morning and thank you for joining us today. Hey, good morning, Andy. Great to be here. Um, could you just uh, give us a bit of an intro into the who, what, where of your role as DPERS? Yeah, well, I've been I've been director of personnel for about 18 months, um, started just as the IR landed. So I'm really responsible for getting the right people in the right place with the right skills. Uh, sounds simple, doesn't it? But a pretty complex in an army, which consists of, you know, 80 or thousand regulars, 30,000 reserves and uh, 10,000 or so civil servants. Um, so my job really is to move us from where we where we found ourselves uh, at the end of the IR to a, a new workforce in the kind of 25 time frame. Getting that whole force approach, I think, is is going to be absolutely key, it's particularly when you're now talking about people as a capability in their own right. What exactly do you mean by that in terms of how you're making that journey? So I've been in the Ministry of Defence in roles uh, over three um, spending reviews. And what I was struck by every time we went through a spending review is the way that we consider people as an overhead, as a cost, rather than as a capability in their own right. And so what I'm trying to do is explain why they should be considered a capability in their own right. And then try and think about how we invest in them in, in the same way they're reinvesting in equipment, upgrading them, updating them, and, and using you know, uh, education and training as a way of making them better. Um, and it, so what, what we've done is we've looked at how can we optimize human performance? Uh, and so through a concept that we are calling human advantage, we're looking at how we can genuinely optimize our people through the cognitive lens, through a social lens, and through a physical lens, so that they are just better, i.e. more lethal uh, in the fight. Because if we're going to have less of them, and that's what the IR has told us, we're going from 82,000 to 73,000, every single person will count. And therefore, making sure that they are as good as they can be in their roles means that obviously we can increase uh, their performance on operations. And that's not just the regulars, that's for the reserves as well, and of course for our civil servants, because we are a whole workforce team uh, and we've got to get that right in order that we can deliver the outcomes that future soldier wants of us. I'm struck when you're talking about that, about the, the, the idea of this smaller, more agile, more flexible workforce and people being at the heart of that. It sounds very, very uh, German military of 1933. We've got, we've got to invest heavily in, in training people up to do the job ahead of them. Um, does this mean each individual has to be smarter? What, what's the investment that you're going to put into that professional military education and training? So, so I think they're already smart. I just want to make, you know, make them better. So, um, you know, genuinely broadening their uh, idea of context, particularly geopolitical context. I think it's really important if you understand the wider world uh, through education that you can apply yourself more naturally to that problem set that you see. So number one thing that we're going to do is we're going to have an NCO Academy. We've never had one of those before. Um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to build an NCO Academy. And from that, we're going to invest in the conceptual component of fighting power, particularly in our, our NCOs, the backbone of the British Army, corporal sergeants, warrant officers. They're the people I think that will genuinely give us the edge because pound for pound, our NCOs are the best. Let's make them even better. Sorry, I'm, I'm smiling at this because, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, well, I can't, I can't help but think of 19, 1940 and the, 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 the Truppenführer concept of Auftrags tactic and, and this idea that, yes, you, you train your personnel to be much more capable of, of leading at a higher level. And that gives you that, that, and you buy into that wider contextual piece. 
of, of understanding what military force is for. Um, does that mean when we're looking at concepts like the strategic corporal, um, does that mean at the same time you're going to be giving them more autonomy um, and more, more uh, command experience at a lower level? I think we're going to have to have more autonomy and I think they're going to have to think really widely and broadly about how they use technology because a smaller army clearly doesn't have mass so the only way that we're going to increase our mass is by using machines and therefore you end up in this kind of multi-dimensional work world where the young corporal is going to have to think really hard about not only his section but probably the weapon systems that are autonomous that are with him in the fight and that I think is a, you know, that's a completely different kind of individual that's going to have to think about people and also about machines. And then also, and, and this is something that struck me is how does he trust the people and how does he trust the machines? And how does he bring them together as a team? Um, that I think needs a lot of work. But um, I think autonomous systems, creating mass through tech, that's where we're going to need our people to be at their best. Fascinating. And of course, the, the underpinning point in all of that is that person who is a, an exceptionally proficient soldier, because as, as we've seen in, in recent conflicts, and I'm not just going to talk about Ukraine, we'll get, get to that later, but the ability of an individual to soldier exceptionally well is still important on the modern battlefield. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think there, you know, there are some inimitable facts that you know, soldiers have to be courageous, brave, strong, fit. Uh, able to deal with adversary, but also think, um, you know, the thinking soldier is the one that's going to win, I think. And if we can help them with that through education and training, um, by them learning from each other through shared experiences, whether that's coaching, mentoring, or just sharing the, um, the, the plans they've got for their own low level training with other corporals, that means we end up with this conversation where they're all thinking about how they can be better. But also, it does put into perspective the idea of empowerment and delegation, which on the battlefield is about dispersal, which is about mission command. And so you can see why all of those things together, as long as you give them the tools to do that, um, absolutely is the right thing to do. But I do think it comes, it, it does come back to this question about mass tech and, and people, how do, you, how do you have an army that's able to punch above its weight, you know, that's just as lethal, is adaptable and can use equipment um, and use technology? Well, you've got to invest in, in the people. And that's why we go back to the, you know, your first question about people as a capability, not an, as an overhead. They become the thing that joins everything together. They're the ones that pull all of the small parts together, the tank, the, the armored vehicle, the weapon system, the UAS, whatever it may be, it's all on the person. Uh, and I think we think slightly differently about this in the Royal Navy and the, and the Royal Air Force, because we need our people. They join, they are the glue for the equipment, not the other way around. And that really comes, comes through. I think it, it, was, it was an adage that I heard many times was uh, the, the, uh, the, the Navy and the Air Force man the equipment, the Army equips the man, purely because it's in a different space. You, you, the platform is the, is the, uh, is the battlefield piece. Um, or the battle space uh, focus for, for, the other for the other two services. Um, of course, when you're looking at this flexibility, this agility of thought um, and, and the person on the battle space, really that begins in barracks and it begins in the, in the wider career piece. So if you want those, those flexible, agile people on the battle space, how are you going to create the space for that in barracks so that people can progress they can have that um sustainable fulfilling career considering that we've got quite rigid structures so we've got a program called program castle which is uh underway at the moment it's been going for about two years which is about you know unshackling us from some of those um ideas of the past and genuinely looking at people and it, and it comes back to people's capability as talent that we manage um, and trying to trying to really get rid of the kind of Victorian attitudes that we've got with, about people, about rank, about their specialisms and about what they, where, where they can go and what they can do and just open, you know, pull it apart and open it up a bit and say to people, right, you, if you get these skills, you can go and do this job, not because you are in the Royal Signals or you're in the Gunners or you're in the infantry, you can do that job. You do that job because you've got the skills. We need to manage people through their skills and their skills, add them all together, you become a specialist and add that together and then you're in a profession. So we're going to use professions, specialisms or trades and then skills as a way of managing our people over the next 
a uh, couple of years and we'll, we'll be getting to the end of that process by the end of 24, 25, which kind of also chimes in with the reduction in the size of the army. And that's for regulars and reserves. And we've done lots of um, really interesting things already. We've got some accelerated promotion policies, which mean that as a soldier, it's about merit and moving you through as quick as you can because you're capable. Um, we've, we've established an army career uh, policy portal so people can understand about their careers because quite a few people don't even know what their career could look like. And so just giving that policy kind of perspective, we're doing, we're, we've done some work there. Um, AOSB SSE, which is uh, Senior Soldier Entry, so the old LE Commission route, We've started a new process um, and it, the first one was last year and again we'll do it again in August because we're going to get to single officer terms of service. We don't have LEs and DEs, we just have officers who are all on the same terms of service. They just join either at the, at the, at the bottom or in the middle uh, and everybody can have the opportunity to excel wherever they kind of find themselves. So we've got that. We're doing a lot of work on digital transfer. So if you join the army and you join a part of the army you don't particularly want to be in or you grow some skills that means that you want to go somewhere else we're going to allow you to move around more effectively and you can do that yourself so you just go online and you say i'd like to transfer rather than before you have to go and ask your troop commander then he asks the sergeant major who then says to the rsm this guy wants guy or last wants to leave and they say no you've got to stay in the in our organization we're going to do that so um, digital transfers is a thing, um, but all of that will be sat inside a thing called the Army Talent Framework. And these words, talent, they're the words that we want to use. Um, we'll have an Army Talent Management System, and within that we'll move people around uh, depending on their talent, not on, on what cap badge they've come from. So I think that's really, you, you know, that's that's quite exciting. And, you know, we've got to slay a couple of dragons in, in amongst all of that, because there's a lot of, you know, cultural things that we can't quite break our way from um, so agile and adaptable doesn't necessarily mean byzantine and victorian the two things that you know can be quite challenging to overcome i think that from what you said there the key point and i wonder if this is one of your one of your sacred cows or the dragons that that need slaying is the existing hr focus um because one of the things that is 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 um uh, quite often rolled out or and, and argued for and against is the idea that everybody's got to have a bite at the same cherry and you do your two years, move on to the next role and you get those broadening appointments, you get those specialists. Um, is that one of the things that is really going to have to change the idea that actually there is no such thing as a single career that will get you from, for example, private to RSM or from second lieutenant to CGS? that there's no single pathway? I think there'll be multiple pathways to the same goal. So if you look at it through a professions lens, at the top of each of those professions, there'll probably be a senior warrants officer and there'll probably be a senior officer. Let's say the PERS profession. There's lots of jobs in there. And if that's your principal profession, you kind of stay in that and you can get to the top. But at least as a route, and it means that you can specialise and it means that you can be you know, professional in that kind of um not silo but within that kind of career tunnel and the, and, the, and they would have different rules depending on what we would favor in that particular profession there'd be a training and education profession probably a close combat profession a joint effects profession and that's where you kind of stay you can you can leave but you can come back and you, but you can see you know, you, it's visible to you what the route is to stardom or the route to your particular interest, whatever that may be. And perhaps if we then start thinking about um, delinking rank and pay and rank and reward, you might want to stay over there as a specialist because your reward is coming through your role and what you're delivering in an operational uh, uh, perspective. But at the same time, you're not getting badgered by people at home saying you're not getting paid anymore. You need to go that way to get paid because promotion is the only way for pay. So that it's a, it is about reward and recognition, and it is about making sure people understand what their route could be, rather than you have to do this job, do this job, do this job, promote, do this job, do this job. You know, it makes makes no sense. It doesn't it, it doesn't answer the problem of retaining people in specialisms and delivering better outputs. So that's what we're going to do as well. That. Kind of very fascinating because it goes back to Senjay's or Seng, Seng's idea of um, professional mastery versus the the professional progression and and how you 
how you really give people that that sense of actually I'm going to be the master of my uh, my end goal, how I'm going to develop myself and how I'm going to then use that for the betterment of the, the organization. Just picking up very specifically on one thing you said there about the, the PERS profession, um, does that mean you're going to have a different military secretariat um, structure in terms of who goes up to, for example, to, to Glasgow? Or is it still going to be very much based on, right, this cat badge will will be self-sustained within Glasgow and, and uh, put bums on seats in, in the right place according to their uh, their structures? Well, there's, there's three parts to workforce planning that need to be need to change. One is Glasgow, so that's talent management. How are we going to manage that talent? By profession, by cat badge, or is there a, you manage by cat badge to a certain point and then by profession, which is what we do now with career fields. But there is, you know, where's that line drawn? Then there's the workforce planners in my organisation. They currently do it by cat badge. Well, we probably don't want to do that. We probably want to do it by skill and profession. Uh, and that, and then, you know, in the land operations centre, finding the right people by skill, not by cat badge, and therefore trawling and making sure we've got the right people on the all back would be done by skill. And then there's the strat org bit, which is the overall structure of the army, which currently looks like a load of regiments with cat badges. Well, probably we need to have a load of regiments with a cat badge, clearly, but those people in it have skills. Yeah. Um, so that you can put the right person in the team to deliver the outcome of that particular organization. So there's a lot in this. It's not you know, simply wave a magic wand and tomorrow we'll be doing it by professions. We've got to step through, you know, talk about it first, build the skills base, build the job spec. So every single person has a job spec that talks about skills. And then over time, perhaps two years, get to the point where we can manage people by profession. So, you know, let's see what Glasgow might look like. Let's see what the workforce planners might look like here and what strap org might look like. But I, on top of all of that, we've got to change the digits as well. Because at the moment, we're still managing people on spreadsheets and a bit of JPA. There is a digitization uh, work strand that needs to go throughout that so that we can genuinely get the best out of it. I'm still astonished that we can't press a button and see what the workforce looks like in 10 years, identify skills gaps, bring it back and keep modeling it and talking about it. That's only because we're kind of hidebound by the digits we've got at the moment. So there's a lot to this and it's not going to be quick. Um, so we've got to go through this kind of IOC language of skills through to perhaps a change in the way that we organize ourselves and the processes. But what I must say is that cap badges are not, you know, they're not dead. They're really important to us. The regimental system fundamentally underpins our fighting power and is the thing that brings together teams. You know, it's really important that we don't lose sight of that. Um, so we're still going to have um, a cap badge system. We're still going to have a regimental system. But we're going to manage people on an individual talent basis by their profession. It, going thinking about the cap badges, thinking about because that's very structural, but you're 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 maintaining it, but then giving the people the, the flexibility within. So, I mean, what we've covered thus far, really, you can you can boil down to the lived experience, giving that people that uh, flexibility, that professional mastery, um, that sense of their own ownership of their career. Um, the, the different structures, the, the way the organization is going to be structured and and um, and built to enable all of that. But then you're talking about the, the cat badges and that really comes back to culture and the moral component. The moral component of fighting power is cultural. Um, now, all of the armed forces have at times found that their culture, there's something jarring within it. So how are you going to evolve that culture so that it's not a barrier to progression and limiting your ability to deliver the people plan and putting it putting a limit on individuals at, at the same time? So, you know, last year was a pretty torrid time for the army. Um, we had the Atherton report that came out, pointed us in a certain direction. Then we had a, a moment with the Secretary of State at the Army Board. Um, and we also had the Wigson and Gray reports, which which were a whole defence thing that kind of telling us that there is something not quite right. It's not broken. Our culture is not broken, far from it. But it, there's some areas that we could get better at, particularly around inclusion. And so um, it, it does go to your point about the moral component. Teams, we need the best teams we can possibly have, whether that's, you know, the team in a, in a, in a tank, the team in a warrior, the team in the office. It doesn't matter. You need to have the best team possible. 
And so uh, early, uh, sorry, late last year, uh, the army board sat and then CGS said, right, we're, we're getting after this and we're going to do it through um, teamwork. So the idea of teamwork is to describe what we mean by good culture around the very simple concept of having a team, right? Everybody wants a good team. Um, and you could use rugby analogies or football analogies, you know, the right person in the right role on a on a rugby field you know it doesn't matter who you are you've always got a place um but i think it's much deeper than that it goes much further than just a simple you're a lock or you're a hooker or you're a, a winger i think you you've got to think slightly more broadly than that um and so what the army did is it it did an amazing thing which um was pretty you know it's castigated by the, the press it stopped for a day it just stopped and it it had a big conversation around what it's like to be in the army and what everybody in the army, because this is a bottom up thing, doesn't matter how many policies we write and say change, you know, it doesn't matter how many carrots or sticks that we, you've got to get the organisation to recognise that it wants to be better. And so CGS was, you know, did an amazing thing, he just said stop. And so the army stopped for a day, uh, 8th of February, uh, and everybody um, had a conversation with each other about what it was like to be in the team, what it was like to be inclusive. Um, and that was a, you know, from my perspective, I thought that was an amazing thing to do. It wasn't, you know, some sort of woke agenda. This was about making the army better. And imagine the time as well. We were starting to run up to the Ukraine and people were saying, look at the army. They're stopping to have a chat with each other while, you know, this thing's happening in Eastern Europe. So, um, yeah, really powerful. And the idea is that teamwork is the, you know, kind of programme of events that now carries on. We talk about the team and teamwork all of the time and everything we do. We've changed a lot of education stuff and we've changed um, the way that we do our business in our barracks. Uh, and we also have, well, there's about, I think there's 32 or 33 different actions that fell out of Wigston, Atherton um, and Gray, our own thoughts as well. You know, things like improving body armor for our women so that they've got you know, ver uh, um, scalable vests for everybody that fit, 25 different shirts available, hair policy, mentoring, zero tolerance to sexual misconduct, army organizational cultural framework. I mean, it just lots of stuff that we probably should have done, but when we got the, you know, the bit of a kick, we just, we're now getting on with it. So personal clothing system will be changed by the end of the year. We've reviewed maternity policy, menopause policy, um, we're increasing awareness of understanding of flexible service. I mean, in terms of that cultural thing, we've also we've also done a few things around selection processes. So this summer, uh, May, second or third week in May, we're doing um, the one star command assessment process, which is a week long thing where we're going to test our prospective one star commanders um, through a number of different tests. Uh, add that to their report system and then select them because you know if you've not got the right commanders in play then what's you know the, how do you how do you make sure the culture's right so i mean it's it's legion in lists of stuff but all stuff that we should have been doing um, but it does fundamentally come back to you know team teamwork is the thing that's that's how we're trying to get after our culture uh driven absolutely from the top all the way to the bottom private soldiers saying what a fantastic day we got to talk to each other rather than you know, go out in the ranges or wherever it may be. So we'll probably do a couple more of those. That idea of, of taking that time to just stop, do a reset, do when you are as busy as you are, and you can see why people perhaps got the wrong end of the stick, but it comes back to actually, no, we need to take stock of where we are and we need to decide where we want to go. And we need to, so having that reset really does make a difference. And you look at, every project management tool there is and at some point in there there's a reset type of, there, there's right stop take take stock um and bringing it back to leadership to teamwork is and it's making sure that the team does indeed work um which is a leadership function and culture is part of that leadership function as well um so that really does seem to all tie it in together quite quite nicely um of course, one of the things that we, we see with culture and teamwork and leadership is on the, the place where you see that in action is on the battle space. We've seen that now from an observer's perspective out in Ukraine, where you've got a military that transformed between 2014 and 2022, and you've got one which apparently 
didn't to the same extent. What takeaways are, are you having from watching what's going on in terms of the moral component, the fighting power, the physical component? Um, so I won't I won't riff on about um, javelin and tanks because I think there's a lot to go on combined arms manoeuvre and it would be wrong with the director of personnel to probably comment too much on that. But in terms of you know the, the moral components, I think the clear, resounding, and enduring message for me is the preeminence of the moral component. You've got to get that right. The will to fight, probably against the odds, to endure and then suffer. Uh, and I think the Ukrainians are suffering in the name of national sovereignty and individual liberty is, is, a, is, is the reason why they're doing so well. We can accessorise them with stuff, but their moral component is the thing that's um, making them win. Um, uh, I think that um, that's the lesson we really need to think about. How, how do we make, and it comes back to teamwork, doesn't it? You know, yeah. How do you make a team genuinely against the odds um, through strong leadership and clear team goals, you know, deliver the resilience against uh, even the most daunting devotes. So I think there's other points as well, isn't there? You know, I'd highlight probably, you know, future soldier tells us that we're going to have training teams overseas. Um, you know, what part did we play in training, you know, 20,000 plus uh, Ukrainian soldiers with our training with our basic leadership skills, perhaps our resilience, tactics and logistics, uh, and what, what benefit that provided them for their fight against the Russians. So in terms of what Future Soldier is about and what we think about persistent overseas engagement, um, training overseas through, you know, op orbital from 2014, I think that that's something we've got to remember. So before the bang, what were we doing and what part did we play and what part did our people play uh, preparing the Ukrainians for uh, the fight that they've got uh, now, um, I think there's a broader, I suppose, macro perspective on all of this um, beyond the moral component, which is about the cohesion of like minded nations in the face of what well, brutality and aggression and wanting discussion pulling together NATO. You know, we can look at ourselves as a small nation with a small army, but when you think about NATO and the part that we can play in that, and the galvanising spirit of an organisation like the British Army, whether we're in Estonia with our people there, uh, across the Eastern um, kind of uh, European nations, and uh, what we did before in Ukraine. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty powerful lesson. It's about bringing your mates to the fight. Uh, and I think, you know, that, that is something that is uh, quite strong. And also that kind of making sure our people understand how important allies are, and how important your friends are and how important the person next to you in the trenches, whether they are, um, you know, a female or the black or they're gay, doesn't really matter. You're all in it together in the in the trench. Um, so I, I think that's quite a powerful thing. Um, and there's probably this kind of ethical understanding of what's right and what's wrong that runs deep in our army. Um, and I think that's something that you can't bottle and, and I think is in, is really important um, because that fundamentally enhances the moral component. You know, that ethical understanding, the values and standards that we can bring um, so that we're ready for whatever the government asks us to do. But it does come down to, to you know, small team cohesion, doesn't it? And then I go back to the very point of the kind of at the beginning, people as a capability, NCO Academy, small teams, of really determined, capable, smart, lethal soldiers. Doesn't matter how big you are, it does it? It's not the size of the dog. It's the fight in the dog. And I think that's the kind of mentality, the will to win through the moral component that, that stands us in good stead. And that's what I genuinely think is the difference between us and every other army. Uh, I think that's that is genuinely well well said and from my my understanding and my my personal experience working with some there's that classic line in the in the in the uh, in the squaddy uh, lexicon of uh, films dog soldiers where where he's he's thinking about the zoo, uh, Isandwana and Rourke's drift and he's going yeah come on it's just like that it's just like that and you, when you speak to soldiers there is this this idea that it it is that section that platoon and everything echelons up from that. And that's been key to the British military and the British army um, 
really right back to to Corona and and, and pre that, um, and that comes through in, through in all the literature. Just on that sense of the will to win being fundamental, I think we also need to put the will to learn in there, and the very fact that the British Army is willing to learn, willing to take a look at itself, and willing to 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 change. I think that that stands you in good stead. Just very quickly, talked about orbital. Are you also willing to take back the lessons that the Ukrainians have learned in this this 70 day conflict thus far and bring that into the British military? Or are you still thinking that it's going to be very much one way um, transmission? No, no. I mean, the, the lessons they're learning that, you know, they're now the, you know, the preeminent war fighters, aren't they? So we need to learn everything we possibly can from them. Um, I, I think they're probably doing some, you know, they're doing some amazing things, but there's lots of stuff you can see it on the on the internet now. The use of um, drones, the use of small teams, the, the the way that they're fighting, starting to do combined arms maneuver as well, defensive um, of combined arms maneuver. I think we've got to, we've genuinely got to take a step back and look. And and indeed, the director of futures here has got a team that are looking at immediate lessons and long term lessons that can feed into our um a future army kind of uh, proposition but also back into the uh dlw world and learning lessons right now that can change training um we'd be fools wouldn't we not to watch what's happening and learn from from them and you know we doff our caps to them on a daily basis they are doing an incredible job and you know it'd be silly of us to to not think about what we can take from the way that they're fighting and put it straight into our lessons engine and then straight into our experimentation or into our into our training uh that would be that would be mad and it would be slightly stupid of us not to to take that opportunity so uh we are doing it so rest assured we see that um we're thinking really hard about the lessons the ukrainians are learning um so you know that's part of the process i think Major General Griffiths, thank you very much for today. I think we'll leave it there because that's been quite quite broad in its scope, but it but it definitely demonstrates the the journey that the the British Army is on, and actually possibly the journey that the rest of the armed forces are on as well. Um, so, Major General Griffiths, thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Andy. Really appreciate it. A call to arms is part of the Military Sciences Profession of Arms program. The show is produced by Pepe Van Arnen and Chris Jones and is sponsored by Airbus. If you enjoyed the show, please rate it and leave a review. Your feedback helps us tailor future interviews to what you, our audience, want to know. RUSI is a membership organisation and it is thanks to our members and sponsors that we are able to maintain our independence, challenge orthodoxy and deliver groundbreaking thought leadership. If you consider yourself to be connected to the profession of arms, then perhaps membership is for you. You can find more information at rusi.org forward slash membership. For less than the price of a good cocktail each month, you can join a growing global community with exclusive access to events, research and insights that put you ahead of your peers. Thank you for tuning in. and I look forward to welcoming you back next month for more from A Call to Arms. <laughs>